Welcome back, America, to Sound Retirement Radio, where we bring you concepts, ideas, and strategies designed to help you achieve clarity, confidence, and freedom as you prepare for and transition through retirement. And now, here is your host, Jason Parker. America, welcome back to another round of Sound Retirement Radio. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 427, Your Best Financial Life, with my special guest, Ann Lester. But before we get into this program, uh, let's start out by renewing our mind. I've got a verse here for us. This is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And then something fun for the grandkids. How does a cucumber become a pickle? It goes through a jarring experience. I am really excited to bring you this interview. I had the good opportunity to speak with Ann Lester, and she was just a wealth of knowledge and information. She's very vulnerable. She shares uh, some of her life regrets, some of the best parts of being retired, and some of the things that she really looks forward to and enjoys at this next phase of her life. But let me give you a little bit of information about Ann. Ann Lester is a retirement expert, author, media commentator, top-rated speaker, and former head of retirement solutions for J.P. Morgan Asset Management, where she worked almost 30 years. In 2020, Ann was recognized for her extraordinary lifetime contributions to Americans' economic security with the prestigious Ray Lilly White Award. She is on a mission to help rising leaders retire on their time and target. She is also a media commentator and regular contributor on personal finance and retirement issues. She's been featured on outlets including Bloomberg TV, CNBC, Forbes, Business Insider, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and Barron's. She also co-founded the Aspen Leadership Forum on Retirement Savings with AARP. Her book, Your Best Financial Life, Save Smart Now for the Future You Want. Without any further ado, here is my interview with Ann Lester. It's my good fortune to have Ann Lester on the program. Ann, welcome to Sound Retirement Radio. Jason, thank you so much for having me. I am so glad to have you here. You know, Sound Retirement Radio is all about retirement, and you've got a new book out trying to help younger people prepare for retirement, but I'm hoping we can spend some time talking about people that are just getting ready to make that transition as well. Absolutely. Love to talk about it all. Yeah. So what's your story? What's my story? So uh, professionally, I was a portfolio manager at J.P. Morgan for almost 30 years. I led the retirement solutions group when I left in 2020 and designed and built the target date funds J.P. Morgan has, Smart Retirement. So I spent 20 of those 30 years kind of uh, up to my eyeballs in retirement stuff, Um, behavioral economics, uh, accounting, um, product design, how we build structure, deliver income in retirement, you name it, I kind of was thinking about it. So that's my that's my professional story. My personal story, which I dive into a lot in the book, is that I was a lousy saver um, for mm. myself and fell into all of the behavioral traps uh, that I think many people are familiar with. And it wasn't until I was asked professionally to start building retirement products for people that I kind of, the light bulb went off in my head that maybe this wasn't all my fault and I was a morally weak and foolish person and maybe I was battling my own behavioral wiring that was some of the problem. And that's was where I was able to turn my own financial life around. And that's what I wanted to share in my book. That's awesome. I, and I want to hear more about that story. So you um, you were motivated to write the book because you personally stumbled trying to figure way figure your, your own way out into personal finance. So what, what was a mistake or two that you made that you'd be willing to share with our audience? Well, where to start? Um, one that I talk about a lot is uh, something I did right out of college. Well, so first mistake I made was saying yes to credit cards in college because they were kind of handing them out like candy mm. uh, back in the uh, mid 80s and not understanding it. I, I don't know that this is a mistake I made, but I grew up in a household with uh, parents who were very frugal, grew up, you know, were born in the 30s. Um, And they didn't teach my brothers and I much about or anything about budgeting. Mm. It just was never discussed. And there always seemed to be enough money for stuff that seemed important to my parents. And if, you know, I never heard a conversation about, well, we can't afford that. Mm. It was, uh, well, we don't want to spend our money on that. So I never had a sense of, you know, I got a pretty good grounding in values about how you should be spending your money in alignment with your values. But there was also the the, the thing that has to go with it, it is 
you've got this fixed amount of money, then you have to make those decisions. So the credit cards and that were a terrible combination. And a very classic thing I did, uh, I started working on Capitol Hill uh, when I got my college degree and they don't pay super well. And I was really not quite making ends meet. And I kept kind of struggling with credit card debt in my first job. And I got a small bonus about a year after I got my job. And I bought a baby grand piano with it oh. instead of paying down my credit card debt <laughs> because I was a pretty serious musician and I needed to practice. And that was a good use of my money. Wow. Wow. But there not, is not, not so much. There is not this, so much. There is a tension, though, isn't there, between saving for the future and living your best life now? And there's a balancing act there. So how do you help people psychologically figure out what that balancing act should be, especially for those people just getting started? Because it feels like when you're when you're starting out, you know, every dollar is precious. It's it's magic, right? So I think there are a couple of things, and this is really the first half of the book, is understanding, getting curious about your own wiring, I think is a great first step. Understanding that saving for the future is painful because it feels like you're giving your money away to a stranger, I think helps. Like the reason it feels bad to you is because it feels bad. It's not a, a personal failing of you. It's so we're not wired. Most people, some people are, but most people are not wired to find that pleasurable. So, so step number one is to acknowledge that this doesn't feel good, I think. Step number two is to help people understand the power of compound returns because that's also something I think most people intuitively struggle to get. Like your money will double every seven to 10 years. The more you save in your 20s and 30s, the literally the less you have to save in your 50s and 60s, right? Mm -hmm. There's such power in that, but we our brains don't grapple with that. You don't understand that. You certainly don't understand it until you've seen it happen yourself, right? And mm. you have to see it happen to believe it, right? So some of my book is about that, but but it's also about how to set up hacks to get in front of yourself when you find yourself in a situation where you want to spend some money. Mm -hmm. And I think about it as, as, as figuring out where you can put your bumper guards in. If you are, you know, if anybody who's listening has ever taken a child to a birthday party in a bowling alley, right? They put those bumper guards in so your mm -hmm. ball can't go into the gutter. Like how can you think about your financial life that way? So you can just put some guardrails around yourself so you don't end up in the gutter. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots and lots of ways to do that. The most important one, I think, for people to get their arms around is to make a commitment to themselves that they will save half of every raise. If you get a 5% raise, save two or 3% of it. The next time you get a 5% raise, save two or 3% of it. And that's the way you go from saving nothing when you're 21 and right out of college to building up an emergency savings fund, to putting money in your 401k, and then being able to do things like pay down debt, max out your retirements, buy a house, do all the things that you want to do. But you can't do that if every time you get a raise, you let your consumption float up with your raise. That lifestyle creep that we hear so much about that people regret in their 50s. They they say, boy, I wish I would have not continued to buy the bigger house and the nicer cars and it's it's so easy to do. And I think one of the things I talk about in my book, and that's different today for people in their 20s and 30s, is there's a lot more uh, a combination of temptation in your face all the time because of social media and because of reality TV and because of the access to people living luxurious lives who seem just like us. Mm. Well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, right? You could see those things in magazines, mm -hmm. but they weren't me. Right. There's a book out right now. Um, I don't know if you've read it. It's called Die With Zero, Bill Perkins. Have you, yeah. Have you yeah heard I haven't read book? it. I've heard of it and I've, I've, I've skimmed, I've skimmed the, some of its contents. Yes. Well, in his book, he talks, he talks a lot about uh, recognizing that there are times in your life when you can do certain things that you won't be able to do other, you won't be able to do things. And so he mm -hmm. really encourages people in their early 20s to spend on experiences while you can enjoy those experiences because what you can do in your 20s, you might not be able to do in your 40s. So not only is it social media, there's also this, um, and, and this is a very popular book. That's the reason I'm reading it because I'm curious to know what people are thinking about. And, yeah. and I can see why it resonates with people because it's saying, hey, don't worry about saving for the future. That's going to come later. You'll figure that out. And when you're in your 20s, go have the Go live your best life. Go have those rich experiences. What What would you say to that? Or what's the I, again? There's a there has to be a balancing act between yep. living for the day, living for the moment, and also saving for the future. I 
I have a lot of sympathy for that, actually. Partly <laughs> one of the reasons I'm bad with money is I did that myself. Um, <laughs> and and I, I don't really regret it, but I can say that now with hindsight, having landing in a in a career and and having you know some combination of luck and skill that got me to a really well-paying job not everybody's going to have that combination of luck and skill right and education and whatever um so i i i'm very fortunate that 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 it all worked out for me i guess we've given our kids similar advice which is and i i'd phrase it differently the time to take risk is when you've got relatively little to lose mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i would say you know, my husband and I both moved overseas in our 20s and worked overseas. Um, you can do that when you don't have obligations, when you don't have kids, when you're not disrupting a family. I would say I would put in the camp building life skills. Those are things you should be doing in your 20s when somebody says this sounds interesting. I don't I personally don't think it means you know, dropping everything and going to live your best hashtag van life. Um <laughs> and and not and not having a a series of planned off ramps mm, I see, yeah. to that. Right. So I don't think it's a necessarily foolish, but, but again, I, I find myself saying now, boy, I better get all the skiing I can in now because I'm turning 60 this year. And guess what? Those knees are not going to want to do this all day long. Right. So, so I'm, I'm doing that a little bit now with some physical things that, sure. and I'm very conscious that my physical time may be running out. I, I think in your twenties, you know what? I don't think that's such a challenge that said, I think, ignoring the financial reality of that decision is foolish. So again, I think one of the reasons I wrote my book is to help people understand the consequences of decisions they don't know they're making. Oh, that's why that's powerful. And I want right? to, there's a bunch of questions I want to ask you around because the title of your book is your best financial life. I want to, I want to ask some more questions about that, but I, I, I want to go back because when you started talking about the credit card, when you were first getting started, I remember when I was 18, I was carpooling to college. I got my first credit card. It was a, a gas card, you know, for the gas station. And I remember thinking I was just a hot dog. I'd pull into that gas station and I'd ask everybody in the car, you know, I'd fill up the tank and then I'd say, hey, I'm going to go get some some coffee, some mochas with my uh, credit card here. Does anybody want anything? And, and that lasted until I maxed it out. It was like a $500 max on that credit card. But boy, I'll tell you, I was bussing tables at a Mexican restaurant and it took me so long to pay that credit card off. It was a really painful experience. And I said, I am never using this thing again. I wish I would have stuck to that commitment because I did end up using credit cards again after that, but I didn't use the gas card anymore. But what was your, what were you spending money on, on that first credit card? Do you remember what it was or how much of a yeah. limit you had and how... I, the limit was $500 or $1,000, but when your net take-home pay is $800 a month, which is what mine was, I still remember that, 400 went on rent and I had $400 to live on everything else and I had to buy gas for my car. I had this bratty old car that took a quart of oil every time I filled up the gas tank. Mm -hmm. um, some of it went on car repairs. Um, some of it, it, it was hard to hold. Even in 1986, it was hard to hold body and soul together on $800 a month net in Washington, D.C. back mm, then. So mm. some of it was just, I just wasn't making very much money. So, but, you know, I still remember vividly my boyfriend at the time asking me to go on a ski trip with him when we were going to stay with friends and, and I saved enough for the airplane ticket, but it never occurred to me that I had to buy lift tickets, right? So we were staying for free and we were staying with this guy's family and his parents were feeding us, but the lift tickets were like, whoa, those things were expensive. Yeah. And I didn't have the money and they went on a credit card, right? So I kind of half planned. Uh -huh. So some of it is just, I was just naive, right? I just didn't understand how much things cost. And since I had this handy dandy credit card on, it went. Um, just was kind of sliding in and out of, I'd get a little bit paid off, you know, and the piano thing, I still remember vividly thinking, well, as long as I can make the minimum payments, I can afford to spend my cash on this other thing. Because to me, the minimum payments were all I had to do. The trap of the minimum payments. Next thing right. you know, that's all you can make. And you've got a whole collection of minimum payments and uh, you're barely able to make the minimum payments until uh, you get to the point where you can't make those anymore. And now you're drowning. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yep. And I, I fortunately never, uh, my parents bailed me out actually. Um, I never got to the drowning spot, but I, mm. I, I, and, and, you know, then my husband and I, you know, we were living in Italy, we weren't making much money, we were saving for a wedding. So like, it wasn't like the debt was spiraling out of control, but it was just always there. Always and there, there was always yeah. a, every paycheck was gone, every paycheck was budgeted, there were a, 
a few moments where I was like, well, I can take the credit card and I can make, I can write a check for this and I can move the money here. And it was just always this dance of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. making it work. Right. And yeah. it, that lasted until we were well into our late thirties, early forties, when I just finally thought, oh my gosh, mm. I know what's wrong. And I just set up some rules. Um, what happened? What got you to the breaking point where you said, where you, where you're fed up, you're like, this isn't working. I can't do this anymore. It wasn't as much that I got to the breaking point, and I thank goodness I was asked to <laughs> build these target date funds and started learning about behavioral economics. What what stopped it for me was actually a, a much more sort of psychological thing, which was I had been blaming myself and thinking there was something wrong with me because I couldn't figure out how to do this better, and clearly everybody else around me had figured it out just looking around at them. They didn't have these problems, right? Okay, well, maybe most of them did, and they just weren't talking about it because nobody talks about this. Um, and it's uncomfortable for me to talk about it, frankly, but I, you know, I guess I, <laughs> whatever, here I am talking about it. But what shifted everything for me was learning that it's the way my brain is wired and it's mm. not like a moral failure of mine. I guess I keep imagining my mother wagging her finger at me, telling me she's disappointed that I haven't figured out how to deal with this stuff yet. Right. And so there was this total moral judgment and I think an, a useful analogy for me anyway is food, which is if you are trying to lose weight or saying, I'm not going to eat that cookie, sometimes you dare yourself and you say, well, I'm going to leave the package of Oreos on the counter and I, mm. I'm strong, right? And the next thing you know, the Oreos are gone and you've eaten them all, right? So mm. I, I guess I was playing chicken with myself too. Like, well, I'm a good person. I'm smart. I can figure this out. I can get better at this. And, mm -hmm. and you did, but, but you did. Well, I, I did because I stopped trying to play that game. I stopped saying... I can grit my way out of this. And mm. I just said, okay, here's the deal. You're going to up your automatic contributions. You're not going to ask yourself, are you, am I going to do this or that? You're going to automate it. And then I'm going to set guardrails around our spending so that we can't spend our money. But you have to, I guess, maybe hit bottom in, in some sense in the, for me, it wasn't so You have much to become fed bottom. up. You have to become fed up. You're not, you're not content with the way it's going. I know. Yeah. Well, I think we've all been there. You got to get to the point where you say, I'm, I'm going to do this the right I'm way. Willi I'm willing to change. Like the pain of change is less difficult than the pain of not change. But for me, it was almost like I got this get out of jail free card when I was like, whoa, this isn't my fault. Well, certainly I can set up some rules. It, it, it stopped being hard. Mm. To, to say, I'm going to stop doing this because it was like not my fault. Somehow the fact that I felt like it was my fault made it impossible for me to change my behavior. That's interesting. Don't you think though that taking responsibility is a, a key component of change? You, you have to you have to be willing to submit and say, boy, you know, I am the one messing this up. I mean, our brain is not separate from us. We are our brain and our body. Wow. So, so, but here's the thing. I think there's acceptance and forgiveness. Mm. And I couldn't forgive myself. Interesting. So I couldn't accept it, right? So so I'm not a particularly religious person, but I do know I have very, very uh, uh, profoundly spiritual friends who talk about the grace that you get when you sort of submit to that acceptance. And I think for me, it, it was a little bit like that, right? It's like, I really am wired like this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. It's not like anybody made me buy that piano, right? I totally did. I can accept that I did that action. I couldn't accept that I was the irresponsible person who did that. Mm. And so what I was able to accept was I, I took off the label and I wasn't a bad person because I bought the piano or we decided to renovate our house or, you know, name a thousand things, right? It was... I'm wired to make decisions this way. I accept that I'm wired to make decisions this way. I don't like making decisions this way. How can I set up a different environment for myself so I stop making decisions this way? So, And I took the blame out of it. And taking the blame out of it, let me accept myself. This is the way I'm wired. Yeah, you, you mentioned, you said this several times, the way that my brain is wired. How is your brain wired? to grab whatever is in front of me and not worry about the consequences. I still do it. I still get, I get a bonus. I get paid. You know, I don't have a salary anymore. I'm living a different life. So it's different. And it's like, I, I can feel the, oh, goody, what can I do with this food? Mm, right. That temptation. I like to, it, it, it's so, you know, don't put it in the house. Don't set up a, set up a, 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 a process or a system that's easy for me to follow. I never go shopping without a list ever. Yeah, I so know I'll buy stuff. I want to hear. So we, we, the the way that you're wired is to want to spend. That's like your natural yeah. inclination. Saving is not natural for you, 
but you talked about guardrails. So one of the guardrails, of course, is the automatic 401k or retirement savings that you talked about. The it's other, the best thing ever. Never going shopping without a list. So you you know mm -hmm. what you're going to get ahead of time. Um, what are some more guardrails that you have in place to help protect you from you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's great. I, that that commitment to saving half of every new bit of money coming in, right? It's, it's uh, we're less in the saving part of our lives, I guess, now having hopefully saved enough. We'll see. It's easy to make promises for good behavior in the future. And you still have to keep them. But it's easier to do that than to say, I'm going to do something right now, because your brain is like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go do this instead. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that is is something that I, I, I'm i a big believer in. I, I do this. It was a tip in my book. It's a small thing. But whenever I sign up for something like a new subscription, which I try not to do to begin with, but if I do, I, I have three credit cards and this is not a reason to get a new credit card, people. If you only have one credit card, stay with one credit card. But I always look for the credit card with the closest expiration date to sign up for something new so mm -hmm. that the card will expire and it will automatically prompt me to say, do I really need this or not? I think about all of the ways I can slow myself down, right? If I almost always now close, I like clothes too, right? I, I shop. I almost never buy something when I see it. I'll ask the store if they'll put it away from me for a day. If I can't get back to the store in real life, then guess what? I can't buy it. Gone. Boom. Very rarely do I buy something when I see it. Wow. Um, do the same thing with online shopping, right? Because, hey, click, click, click. I don't let myself do online shopping when I'm on a train or, you know, waiting for something to happen, right? I, I read a newspaper article or I, you know, try not to get on my phone at all, which is a whole other story. But, but like, if you, if you, are cruising things because you're bored. It's a habit, right? I think a lot of people make purchases that they sometimes regret when they didn't have an intention to spend money. I am surprised to hear that you have three credit cards, even I as know. you've gone through this journey. And and uh, because those credit cards, my, we did this too. We did made the same mistake. So for years, we did um, envelope budgeting where we put money in envelopes, cash in envelopes, and that's how we spent. Yep. And it worked really well. And then uh, I yeah. and then I said, okay, this is working good. Let's go to prepaid debit cards. So we went to prepaid debit cards and we put, I had a debit card for everything. I had one for dining out and one for groceries and one for gas money and and one for spending cash. And my kids had prepaid debit cards. My wife had a prepaid debit card. So, and you know, uh, they kind of made, made uh, fun of me for how I would allocate money to all these prepaid debit cards. Well, then the prepaid debit card company they wouldn't let me put as much money in as I wanted yeah. to. So I was stuck. I was like, darn it, I can't, I can't do this. So I said, oh, well, we're good enough. We've been doing this for years now. We can use a credit card and we're disciplined about our spending. We've had a good budget for years. It'll be okay if we use a credit card. Well, I learned that lesson the hard way. Even though I had learned not to use credit cards, I went to the envelope system. I went to the prepaid debit card system. As soon as I turned that credit card on for the family and everybody's using it, it spiraled out of control. Like in no time, the spending went berserk. Oh, that's so interesting. And so, ah. so ended, we ended up paying that credit card off. I mean, I was paying it every month, but then all of a sudden things started hitting and the credit card balance grew. And so I paid it off entirely. And now we don't use the credit card anymore. We're back to just using the debit cards and accepting the fact that they won't let me put as much money in there as I want to every month. But so, but you, you still are using the credit cards. I mean, I was, yeah. kind of, I was trying to justify it for the cash back, but. Uh, the, the points are real. I guess, I guess I put enough guardrails around my spending and I have become better at it that I just don't. It doesn't seem to be a challenge now. The reason I have three actually is I got them when we were still doing all the floaty things, right? So they were mm. they're, they're the credit cards I've had. And one is now um, in my wallet and pays for groceries and things, you know, like everyday things. Mm -hmm. One I use exclusively for online shopping. And that's actually really handy because I can actually, I mean, credit cards will tell you all the balances in the world, but I, I'm really bad at budgeting. I'm really bad at, actually, I'm good at math and spreadsheets, but I'm bad at like keeping track of my spending. It makes mm. me feel really cranky ah. and poor and angry when I do it. So oh, that's, it, that's not a successful, like I actually just get really annoyed with the whole thing and don't want to do it. So that's not a good place for me to go. I know it works really well for some people. So what I do is actually these help me keep track of buckets of spending. So I've got one in real life credit card, one uh, online credit card, and then one credit card that we use pretty much only for travel. Interesting. Okay. So, um, and then you'd pay those credit cards off. You're, always, they're always, they're always paid off. And how, what is your, you, what does your husband, how does, how does he process money? Is he a budgeter or is so he more he, of a no, free spirit I, like you? 
No, no, he's a budgeter. Um, he's he's quite happy to. Uh, it's interesting. We have joint accounts, and we always have ever since we got married. But we kind of divided up the the household spending. That I take care of certain things. He takes care of other things. Like he pays all the utilities. He does all the home maintenance stuff. I do the mortgage. Um, I do the grocery shopping, and it just kind of aligns. We you know occasionally we'll say, well, you know. Do we need to revisit our allocation of expenses? Mm -hmm. And then his money is his money and I, my money is my money, even though we're both on each other's accounts. And I have a credit card on his accounts and he has a credit card for my accounts. And if ever there's a need or a reason to put something on one or the other, we check and say, can I do this? Is it okay? Mm -hmm. And he's he's much less of a um, spender than I am. Like, And it's funny, I have two kids and one's more like me and one's more like him. So the way that you think about this then is um, because you're disciplined about setting the money aside in the investments and set and saving for the future, then whatever is actually coming into your accounts um, are going to get spent. Don't you feel like with the credit cards though, you're spending twice, like you spend on the credit card and then you have to pay to pay the credit card off. To me, it feels like I'm having, when, when I had the credit card, I was having to spend twice is the oh. way it felt to me. Well, that's a really good way to frame it so you don't do it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's I a great tip. Like I can't if you're, use them. Yeah, it, as it as disciplined as I well, was, I, could, I couldn't go back to it. Maybe this is because I spent 30 years managing billions of dollars of other people's money and moving money around all the time. So like this is whatever. Like, you know, I used to do trades that would move a billion dollars here or there. So mm -hmm. like paying off a credit card bill is like, yeah, whatever. I'm just I'm just moving money back and forth in accounts, right? It's... That 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 does not get me. Other okay. things may get me that like, but but like keeping track of my spending and like budgeting and and having like a little thing just drives me nuts. Ah, that's interesting. So, so um, you, the the title of your book is your best financial life. Let's take financial out of there for a second and just help me help our listeners understand. Uh, you have this vision for the future or for what a great life looks like. Um, what does that look like for you? I mean, how. What is it that you're actually saving for? Why why are you trying to plan for the future? I firmly believe that money is not an end in and of itself. It's a means to an end. And I suppose one of the reasons why I got into financial trouble is money doesn't actually mean very much to me. Like it, it is a means to an end. It is a, it is a way to have experiences or or physical things, although I don't care about them so much anymore. But it's it's a way to 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 experience things and have things that make make life meaningful to you mm, mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so for me it's a means to an end and then it becomes you know what what does that life look like in your head are you living it now if you're not living it now where are the gaps coming from some of them have made many of them probably have nothing to do with money mm, maybe some mm, of them do mm -hmm. maybe it's you know you do like traveling you do like i did a eight week when i when i after i retired and after covid eased up a bit i did a eight week pilgrimage walk um, oh. in europe and that was that was, was like one of my bucket lists really really want to do this i want to do more of those right was it that the means, camino I, it, it's a it's a different walk, but it's something called the Via Francigena, which um, is a pilgrimage trail that goes from Canterbury, England to Rome across France. And I did the bit from the Swiss border down to Rome, which was about 500 miles. And it and took eight weeks. Eight weeks, yeah. And did you go by yourself? I did. And I had a tour company arrange it for me. Um, so I had a place to stay. And this was still full on COVID. I mean, it was it's the fall of 2021. And I was really... Um, unhappy about traveling by myself too, unhappy about the idea of staying in pilgrim hostels and stuff. And also having the knees that I do, the the tour company arranged to have my luggage carried from place to place. So I just was hiking with the day pack. And also having somebody know where I was going to show up every night, I felt a little reassuring personally. Um, but it was a phenomenal experience. I I want to do a lot more of that walking. So usually yeah. when, when I hear the word pilgrimage, I think of that as a spiritual experience. Mm. But you said that you're not... A very spiritual a religious. person. I said oh, re religious. religious. I religious. didn't say spiritual. Okay, okay. Um, I it was a very spiritual experience, was and it? I, I uh, yeah, it was. Um, somebody uh, people keep asking me. Actually, I'm writing another book about that now. And the the best way to describe the experience that I can come up with is that I I walked the first sort of week and a half with a friend of mine, and then I did the rest of it mostly by myself. Although you bump into people and chat with people all day long, right? Mm -hmm. And I spent about a week walking with another group of people, which was delightful. And we're still friends. We we're in a WhatsApp group and we talk all the time. But um, I I spent days and days and days completely by myself, and I never once put headphones in. Awesome. Wow. I love I, that. I just 
And I, I'd be walking some days for seven or eight or nine hours. And, you know, a lot of it was physically <laughs> uncomfortable or, you know, I, there's a whole story. We, we wouldn't have time to go into the, to the walk story, but like I ended up almost in the hospital with really badly infected blisters, which I walked on for far too long and in, you know, a great deal of pain. Wow. And I still never wanted to, you know, I think when you put in headphones and you're listening to music or a podcast or something, you're kind of escaping where you are. Totally. And I never, ever, ever once wanted to do that. And I just, it's the only time in my life I have felt present mm. for such long stretches of time that is really like good you're just there and it, it's that to me was a very spiritual experience and again you just cannot help but feel connected to something bigger than yourself when you're doing that so i i loved it and also i was italy and it was the fall and like what's not to like about this whole experience but um yeah. it, it was it was phenomenal so, and I also speak fluent Italian, so it was also like me doing this by myself does not sound as crazy as it as it might because I could speak fluent Italian. So, what was the um, what was the biggest takeaway? What was your big aha? Spending all that time just walking and reflecting and not being distracted by the world. So this is actually the the core message for my next book. Sometimes you have to let yourself quit something before you can find meaning in finishing or achieving it. Oh, I love that. I love that. I had these just terribly infected blisters and almost ended up in the in getting admitted to a hospital because they got so bad and and had to stop walking for eight days and basically traveled with my suitcase for eight days and went back and walked after that. And about two and a half weeks after that, I just hit a wall and I just thought, you know, what am I doing? This is terrible. I'm exhausted. I've been walking for six weeks, you know what am I trying to prove to myself? What am I trying to prove to the world? Who's who's keeping score mm. of whether I'm being mm. a good pilgrim or like, and and I got to the place I was staying that night. I was just like, I quit, like I'm done. And I started going online and seeing if I could change my ticket. And I just, some little voice was like, oh, wait till tomorrow morning, don't do this yet. But I, I committed to quitting, mm. right? I was gonna pull the trigger and I woke up the next morning my feet had started hurting again I got a new a new blister and I just got super paranoid about that and I woke up the next morning and I was like I'll just put my boots on and see how they feel and I put my boots on I was like oh my feet don't hurt and then I was chatting with a woman who ran the bed and breakfast I was staying in and she said oh yeah there's a, a kind of a get out of jail I was going through a super rural part of Italy and there were like no towns or anything and I was like all right if I start walking I'm in like I can't like I'm in and I was also at a hill town and like had just climbed up three thousand feet to get to where I was staying. So like once I start down that hill, I'm not going back up. Right. Or, I mean, it was crazy. Maybe, maybe it was a thousand feet. It was 300. It was, it was a mm -hmm. lot, big, mm -hmm. big climb. And she said, well, here's a business card of this business that like goes around and rescues tired pilgrims because, you know, frankly, a lot of people hit the wall at this point. So I was like, oh, I've got to get out of jail free card. Oh. This That gave me the courage to keep walking. And my feet never bothered me once again. It was like having decided that I was done and I wasn't doing this I don't know. I'd, I'd made this pact with myself that I was going to do this walk and I was going to do this walk and somehow saying, you know what, I can let that go made mm. me recommit and say, I'm doing this because I want to, not because I have to. Mm. That's cool. Yeah, it was a very interesting, uh, they're, 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 as you can tell, I'm still working on this, but, but there's, yeah. there's a thing there. There's something there. Well, I love being outdoors. I love hiking. And one of my personal bucket list items is when my when my daughter graduates from high school, uh, my son's in college now, but when she graduates from high school, one of my goals is I do want to hike the Camino de Santiago. I want mm -hmm. to take some time. And I've talked to some people that have done that. And so it's mm -hmm. fun it's fun to hear your story. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that, uh, that well, time. Check out just the to... Italian. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and if you do that with your daughter or alone? No, no, I'd do it by, by myself. Yeah. Uh, check out the Italian one too. I think, I think that's, uh, I, will. I think that the Italians and the French started it because they were looking at the Camino in, in Spain and going, we ought to get some of that, mm. some of that pilgrim action ourselves. Mm. But, but, um, it, 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 I want to do the Camino now. Uh, it is, it, it was phenomenal and, and doing it when I did it, the time of year I did it. And then right as COVID was kind of still going on, um, there was nobody out there. Yeah, like there cool. were days and days and days that I wouldn't see a soul except when I got to a town. Wow. Um, you, you said earlier that your parents were good with money, but they never taught you about budgeting and something that you ended up not liking. You're not hardwired to oh, budget. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. But it. what about, what did you teach your kids about stewardship or money uh, overseeing, being responsible with what they have? How'd you well, do one that? Of the, yeah. One of the things I found fascinating is my husband and I, you know, you, 
fall in love with somebody and then you have conversations about do we share values is how is this going to go what, one of the things we we had in common was um both of our families for different reasons hitting huge financial potholes when we entered college um my dad lost his job and his his father died so we just suddenly had these big you know rocky financial things entering college and neither of our families gave us an allowance mm. and our parents gave us money when we asked for it and we both looked at those two experiences and said, we never want our kids not to know how much money they can spend. Because when I went off to college, my parents said, well, just spend what you need. And I was like, well, I, I don't know how much you can. I mean, I asked them to give me a budget and they wouldn't. Mm. They just mm. said, well, we don't want you. We just tell us what you need. And I was like, ah, mm -hmm. I know you don't have any money. How can I ask for it? It was terrible, terrible, mm. terrible, terrible situation. Um, and so we both said, we're never going to do that to our kids. Um, and we gave them allowances starting when they were three and four, five, I think. And we told them they had to save half of it and they could spend half of it. And then we started talking about donations when they were a little older. Actually, no, right right from the gate. So it wasn't a one third, one third, one third. I know a lot of people do that, but the, 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 the donat donating was a little more episodic. And we worked with them once a year, twice a year to find somewhere they wanted to donate some money to. But mm. um, they saved half and they could spend half. And then... This was, you know, in the late early 2000s when there were still physical toy stores around and you could buy very the smallest little Lego kits. My I have two sons and they loved Lego. You could buy the smallest little Lego kit. I would think it was $3.99. And we gave them $2 a week. They had to save one. They could spend one. And if they went and spent their dollar, they got a really crummy little breakable thing that would like be nothing. And then we said, you know what? If you save your money till next week, we'll give you an extra dollar. So then they had $3. And then the next week they had $4 and they could buy that Lego. Uh -huh. And so they started saving money for specific things when mm. they were in elementary school. I um, love, I actually love that saving for a specific goal. I like, I like uh, compartmentalizing it, money like that. It, it worked so well that they just grew up knowing that they could save their money. And my parents were joking that they wanted to put their money in the, in our bank because they got a much better interest rate there. And we're like, yeah, it's only for the kids. But, um, because it doubled their money in a week, but mm. but it, it worked. And then we gave them debit cards on their accounts when they were, I think, in the fifth or sixth grade, as early as the bank would let us give them to them. Mm. And we thought, you have to learn how to manage this magic card, right, that can suck all your money out, like, young, when the consequences will be small, and we can help you navigate that. And mm. then I read a great book called Money Doesn't Grow on Trees, Um and I keep remembering, forgetting the author's name, but it's, I don't know if it's still in print. You can still find it out there. And she had a great uh, thing where she said, you should really give your kids total control over the money you want them to be spending so that they have to make budget decisions. And you sort of increase the range of things that they're responsible for as they get older. So ideally when they go off to college, you've got them in charge of spending Mm -hmm. So we started doing that when they were in middle school, I think, and they had to decide if they wanted to buy a new video game or if they wanted to go somewhere with their friends after school or if they wanted to go see a movie, like whatever the thing was, we're like, this is your money. Do with it what you will, but it has to cover these categories of spending. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Giving them the the responsibility to own their decisions, own their purchases, and own running out of money. You know, if they blow it, and then living that's, with it. that's part of the, yeah, that's part of it. One thing that this uh, author suggested that we never implemented was clothing, and and uh, they never would have bought new clothes. So I think for, <laughs> if you've got a kid who like a, you know, typically a, a girl, but I think some boys too, like, it was like, yeah, they would just never buy new clothes. So one, I, I, I kept that one, but... One of my favorite savings goals right now is uh, my wife and I were saving for my daughter's wedding. So every month we have money that goes aside into this investment account. And it gives me an opportunity to pray for this future husband of hers and pray for my daughter. But I, I just love thinking that we've got this wedding that's going to come. And because I know when my wife and I got married, it seemed stressful. My father-in-law, you know, he said, well, he, uh, at the time, he said, here's $6,000. Um, you guys can go have whatever kind of wedding you want with $6,000. And we, we fortunately, we got married in Alaska in this little log cabin, and we had 12 people at our wedding. So we were actually able to save money as a result of that uh, gift that he made. But just uh, just to know that there's going to be this money set aside for this specific purpose, um, and it doesn't feel like it's even mine anymore because I know it's yeah. already, I feel like it's already been spent, you know? I, I think... Having goals like that is phenomenal. It's a fun way. To, it's a fun way to think about money. I know a lot of people like to do that with car purchases as well. But you know, retirement is so. It seems so far off 
for so many people. When is it ever too late to start saving for retirement? And I really want you to answer the question for for the young people that are trying to figure this out. What's the what is the minimum that they need to be setting aside for retirement? How can they just learn to live without that money? If you start saving for retirement in your early 20s, I think if you're saving 10% of your gross paycheck into a tax advantaged account, there were several ifs there. I think that is going to be enough. Mm -hmm. It may not be a luxurious or a stress-free retirement, but it will be enough. 10%. I think if you say 10%, if you say 15% starting in your early to mid 20s or even late 20s, you're going to be just fine. I think, and, and and my book actually has something that I, I put together, which is a simplified version of a, a chart we used to use when I was at JP Morgan that we internally called the heart attack chart which was a little diagram of how much should you have saved in terms of your current income uh, to have to be able to retire at 65 and maintain your your current lifestyle. Mm. And we called it the heart attack chart because when people looked at it, they had a heart attack because most people haven't saved that much money, right? And, and what it means is the later you start, the more you need to save as a percentage of your income to be able to retire at 65. Now, there are plenty of ways to change the math. You can retire at 70. You can scale back your spending, right? But But- 10% is enough if you start when you're 21. And that may seem like a lot if you're just starting out, but if you save half of every future raise, you can get up to 10 or even 15% of savings going to your retirement account by the time you're 30. There's a movement these days, I'm sure you've heard of it, the FIRE movement, financially independent, retired early. And I'm really conflicted about this um, idea. I love the financial independence part, this retire early, because I think of work as purpose. I think of work as, you know, we we are designed to contribute, to make a contribution to society. Why would I ever want to stop contributing? And I think part of it is, too, that I've, I've taken some big chunks of time off and I find that I get bored really quickly. Like for me, the idea of going and sitting on a beach for weeks at a time is, or playing golf every day, like I, I just don't, I, I wouldn't enjoy that. So what are your thoughts about financially independent retired early? Are we, are we setting wrong expectations? You see all these in, uh, social media influencers talking about they retired at age 40 and uh, you know, you should too, but. Well, and now their, their job is being a social media influencer and that's how they're making money. But um and how they're spending their time. Uh, I I think at its best, right, financial independence retire early is, is a way to A, create choices for yourself. Mm-hmm. And the more aggressively you save, the more choices you will have about where you want to live, what how you want to be spending your time. Um, I think if retire early means leaving a corporate job you don't adore and don't find particularly meaningful to spend your time contributing in ways you do find meaningful for less money. I'd like, yeah, double thumbs up on that one. I guess that's Mm. what I've done. If it means, and I think this is where people can get into trouble with fire. And I actually talk about this in my book as well. Like it's hard to save as much as you need to save consistently and it can lead you to make some choices you will regret about living your life when you're young and as you said earlier Mm. have energy have maybe fewer obligations and can enjoy things right if you're trying to save 20 or 30 20 maybe not so much but 40 or 50 percent of your income Mm -hmm. you're living a very constrained life and if you enjoy that and you enjoy that stuff like it would drive me i would run a screaming but if that's gratifying to you then great you'll have lots of choices and you should do that but I think one of the risks is that people start pursuing that because they don't like their job. Mm, mm, yeah, and if right. you don't like your job, there, there are other things to do before just deciding that you're going to save like crazy and retire early. Do something um, you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? Exactly. I'm a big believer in that. The second thing that I think can be dangerous is if you step off or out of formal employment, it may be far harder than you think it will be to get back into formal employment. That's Yes, and, absolutely. I've seen that play out. And and you really may end up regretting that decision. So, you know, really stress test your assumptions. And then I guess the other the other thing I just think is dangerous about some of the fire stuff I've seen out there is I think their assumptions about the four percent rule are are ludicrous. Mm. Like that you can rely on that to sustain a 
you know, the classic one is, well, if you can live on $40,000 a year, then you have a million dollars and then you're set for life. And I'm like, if you're in your thirties or forties, you're no, 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 no. So many bad things can happen. Inflation, right. uh, you know, five bad years in the market and you're done. Right? Yeah. I mean, Bill Bankins, that 4% rule was based oh, on a 30 terrible. year, 30 year retirement. It wasn't based on a 60 year retirement. Right. <laughs> and, and based on a specific time in the market and based on a 64, I mean, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right, right, I right. actually wrote a paper when I was at JP Morgan, you know, basically, uh, I forget what the title of the paper was 10 years old now, but basically like, what are people doing? This thing is crazy. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, you had a long dangerous. career at JP Morgan. Do you regret mm -hmm. retiring? You know, there are a lot of things I miss about working. Um, regret is a word I wouldn't choose. I miss leading a team. I miss being part of a group of people that's all focused around a goal. Um, I miss the camaraderie. I miss just, gosh, there are some amazingly talented, fun, interesting, smart people. Like I just felt lucky to be in that environment. I miss the resources you have in a really large company like that. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just lots of resources. And and I cannot imagine going back to a full-time job. Yeah. I just cannot imagine doing it. I'm on, I wrote this book. I'm out talking to people about it. I feel very passionately about sharing the message in this book. Um, I serve on a couple of corporate boards. I feel like I get my collaborative business brain head engaged with that. And I have a lot of choice around how I spend my time. And I would, I, I can't imagine giving that up. I, I was saying that I wasn't going to say never to another full-time job. And the longer I don't have one, the harder I find it to imagine kind of, it would feel like a very small box. What is it I that, guess. yeah, what is it that, um, well, I guess uh, ask this a couple of different ways. Number one is what did you appreciate or enjoy the most when you first retired from that corporate job? And what is it about that box that you feel you wouldn't want to return to? What is it that you would lose by going back? I love being able to sleep for eight hours a night. Wow. I, and I just so interesting. could not make that work. So I just could not make that work. You know, and I live in New Jersey. I was working in Manhattan. There was an hour and a half commute. I used that time really well. I loved, actually, I occasionally miss my commute, which is a really weird thing to say. But but um, I had an hour on the train of quiet time that nobody bothered me. And I had a half hour walk across Midtown Manhattan, which was my exercise twice a day. So that that was not like I, I didn't, I, was, I wasn't driving in a car for that long. That would have been horrible. But I, I really... I like to sleep, you know, I'm a yeah. better person when I get eight hours of sleep a night. It's healthier, right? If somebody um, offered I you think... a job, if somebody offered you a job um, in the box, as you will, but they said you could have your own hours, sleep as much as you want, uh, would you consider it? it? It depends on what it was. The other thing about, I said, putting myself back in that box is, and maybe if I were the boss of a of a company, I was a CEO, I don't think you're ever free of constraint of worrying about Mm. And maybe this tells you more about me, right? But like, I I, I felt like I was always self censoring myself, and and just, I, you know, I and, and people talk about this sometimes. Can you bring your whole self to work? And I don't think I ever didn't feel like I could bring my whole self to work. But I always felt like I was like, well, I've got to make sure I say the right things. I mm -hmm. I. And it was never anything that I felt conflicted about. So it's 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 hard for me even to articulate, but it just, I wasn't fully my own person. I was, you know, head of retirement solutions at JP Morgan. Okay, well, that is one of my coaches once said, like, you're Godzilla. And when you turn around, your tail can wipe out Tokyo. Like you have mm. a big tail mm. when you are in a role like that. And you have to be mindful of what you say to your team. You have to be mindful. You're on the inside of a lot of confidential information, right? There's just a lot of censoring that has to go sure, on sure. about what you do, how you say it. I was a licensed professional. I couldn't tell people that you should do this. Well, it might be good if you thought about this, right? I mean, you have to constantly be saying is what I'm going to say, getting me into regulatory trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, it's just, there's just this constant set of filters that you have on. And I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what are you enjoying the most about this? Because you haven't retired, you're speaking, you're writing, oh, I'm busy. I'm you're busy. on corporate board. So what do you, what are you enjoying the most about this next phase of life? This new, this, this uh, transition towards retirement, I guess. I love um, the mix, right? I love the creative. I love public speaking. I enjoyed 
in hindsight, writing the book, although I wouldn't have told you I was enjoying it while I was doing it. Um, but I really do enjoy conversations like this. I enjoy helping people understand more about themselves. I love the teaching side of having written this book. Um, and I really enjoy, again, with the business brain part of me, getting to still um, contribute uh, to, to, to companies that I, I think are doing interesting work. And I enjoy the business analytical kind of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. part of it as well. And I enjoy having a lot more control over my time. Mm -hmm. Like I was, uh, uh, I think it was almost two years ago now, which the time is flying, but uh, I was doing a, a course on public speaking with a, a group of women. Uh, be, we became very good, good friends and one of them was Irish and she was having a milestone birthday. And she said, oh, would you guys consider coming to my birthday party? And I was like, sure, I'll fly to Dublin for a weekend. Like, why not? I got a lot of frequent flyer That's miles, awesome. right? So speaking of credit cards, um, <laughs> like I've got some points. I can I can just go fly to Dublin. Uh, why not, yeah. right? Or, yeah, time, or, that time well, freedom this, and, and not have to worry about when you're coming back. Well, and there's it's not like there's not stuff to do when I'm not keeping up with my email and all that, but I just can say yes to more things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's good. And say yes to stuff I want and right. not because I, it, it, back to my walk, right? What's a should and what's a want? Well, I've sure have been enjoying this conversation. Um, I want to, if you, if you would uh, give your perspective, because a lot of the people that listen to this show are getting ready for, they're like within five years of retirement mm -hmm. and um, they're getting ready to make that transition into retirement. And you, you worked in this world from a different perspective than most people, but from your perspective, um, cause we got to hear a little bit of your personal story heading into retirement yourself, but from your perspective on the corporate side, um, what, what would you want people to know about retirement planning based on this body of knowledge and wisdom that you've accumulated? So I think from a financial perspective, the single most important thing you should, she said, using a word I don't like, I invite you to do is think about your cash flow really carefully mm -hmm. and one of the reasons I'm on corporate boards, which I enjoy thoroughly, is partly because there's money <laughs> and they pay me. And, you know, I did, my husband and I did not save enough money for us to continue enjoying the lifestyle that we were enjoying while I was an executive. And I made the decisions I did with very little regret from a financial perspective, but it was also with eyes wide open, having done a whole bunch of math, if if I never earn another dollar of income, can we literally afford to keep living where we're living? Mm, mm. And the answer was probably, all right, well, that didn't, that doesn't feel very good. All right, well, then let's think about income. Um, so 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 think about cash flow really carefully and and spend a lot of time thinking about, I think about needs, wants, and desires um, or needs, wants, and wishes. I know a lot of financial planners say. Another thing I think is really, really helpful is to spend some time thinking about what does failure look like to you financially? Mm. And I thought about it in two ways. One was uh, when when my husband and I first lived in Italy, um, he had just gotten a job. I didn't have a job yet. We had no money. And when I say we had no money, we couldn't afford to buy meat every week. We had no money. Mm -hmm. And we would make a decision. Do we want to buy an English language newspaper, which were just incredibly expensive at the time? There was no internet at the time. Um, or do we want to buy meat? And mm. we bought uh, a chicken at the grocery store, like a whole chicken that was going to be a roast chicken. And then it was going to be chicken pasta sauce and a chicken risotto. And like, it was going to turn into chicken soup. And like, that was going to be the meat for the week. And we got it home and unwrapped it. And it was called a polo tradizionale, a traditional chicken. And it was cheaper than the other chickens. And I was like, it's chicken. And we unwrap it and it had been plucked. Head was still on, feet were still on, and it had not been cleaned. <laughs> Right. So we're like, all right, well, we can't take this thing back. We've unwrapped it. So we get out one of our two cookbooks, one of which was like a 1950 edition of A Joy of Cooking. And, you know, guess what? In there is a section on cleaning game and birds and mm. firmly grasping the neck of your chicken in your left hand, carefully reach inside with a sharp knife. And right in there, we went and cleaned the chicken. I was like, I never want to be that poor again. That yes. is too poor. That is just too poor. Yes. I will have failed if if I hit a point where I find something that I now, of course, I can clean a chicken now. So I know I can. So I would again, but like that's not my life. The second thing I said was if we travel, I never want to have to share a bathroom again. Mm -hmm. I don't mind not staying in fancy hotels. I don't mind staying in cheap places, but sharing a bathroom, 
I never want to do that. And then I went and went on a trip with my high school uh, college roommate and we ended up sharing a bathroom and it was fine. So I've already abandoned that one mm -hmm. as a, as, as a thing, but the chicken never. So because you know what it's like to be at that low point with the chicken, um, what today makes you feel like wealthy? When, when do you say, oh, oh I, this, this makes me feel like I'm really doing well in life. Two things. And, and they are privileged things. I don't have to clean my own toilet. That makes me feel really wealthy, not having to clean my toilet. Mm -hmm. I know how to clean toilets. I've cleaned a lot of toilets. I do not have to clean my own toilet. And the second one, actually speaking of chickens, is not having to worry about whether or not I can afford to buy something in the grocery store. Yeah, that's a good... That's I buy good. what I want to eat. I'm not crazy. I buy things on sale. I'm not, you know, eating filet mignon every night. But if we want to have a nice steak, we have a nice steak, right? Yeah, yeah. For me... And I also buy a pack of frozen chicken thighs at the same time. But like, you know, it's it's like... I don't have to, I don't have to worry about that. Yes. For me, cause I've been in that same boat as you, you know, I know what it's like to not have anything. And so, um, I love that when I fill up my car with gas, it's like, I am so grateful that I don't have to worry about filling the car up with gas. I don't have to worry about putting a certain dollar amount in. And yeah, it's just, that's a, that's a good feeling for me. It's like, okay, we're winning. We're winning this game here. You mentioned cash flow. Uh, two things actually I wanted to come back to be, you said be very intentional and mindful of cash flow. What do, what do you mean by that? Like when you talk about cash flow, what are you talking about? What money do you literally have coming in that you can count on? And uh, full disclosure, I will say I'm an, ed an education fellow, which is a volunteer position for something called the Alliance for Lifetime Income, which is helping to demystify annuities and help people understand how they can be helpful. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because People, when they retire, will hopefully have Social Security. If you're retiring early, please don't claim Social Security early if you think you'll live to be in your 80s. Like, please wait till you're 70 or at least 67 to take Social Security, please. Um, but think about guaranteed income you know you have coming in, mm. especially if you haven't saved enough not to worry about this. Think about what are the guaranteed sources of income you have coming in that you can count on no matter what, and how much you know you have to spend no matter what. Like, what mm. are those two numbers? And if there's a big gap, one of the things I encourage people to do is to think about filling that gap up. In my case, it was getting some jobs, right? Mm. It might be if you're in your late 60s or 70s thinking about annuitizing some money. I don't know how, how you feel about annuities, but having money that you don't have to worry about if you don't have a pension, right? Most people retiring now probably don't have pension income unless you were in the service or a you know first responder or something or a teacher. But that guaranteed money is mm -hmm. really helpful for a couple of reasons. One, it's peace of mind and do not discount that. <laughs> Second, it can let you take a little more investment risk with the assets that you have got. Mm -hmm. And if and when we hit another downturn, and it will be when, not if, you can cut back on your discretionary spending without really going to the chicken place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, you said guaranteed income compared to essential expenses. What's that ratio? Like how much of that needs to be funded for you to feel confident for in your mind? I, I think the less money you have saved up, the closer ideally that should be to 100. Wow, okay. And- the reason I say that is because if you have not saved up a lot of money, you're, it's going to be very, ch and, and, and I guess the second part of this equation is how much truly discretionary income uh, spending are you doing? Mm -hmm. You got to know, you got to know those numbers to know if you're going to, if you've saved enough, you have to know how much you're spending on both the essential and the discretionary. Yeah. And if the non-discretionary spending is, you know, 70 or 80% of your total spending, that means you've got very little room to cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If something happens to the markets, which means that you're going to be pulling money out and and lowering forever the amount you can take in the future from those accounts. So and and that's why I say the closer you are to the line, right? The more seriously I think you should consider trying to bump up the floor of guaranteed income because then that lets you invest that money and not worry about it so much too. Yeah, that's and you great. can let it grow, and then and then 
you know, if you're in the, in the fortunate position of, well, maybe I won't take that cruise that year, that's fine. But if you're not in that position and you're thinking, well, then maybe I won't refill my prescription, that's not fine. That's not okay. Yeah, I've had those conversations. What about, um, you mentioned crunching the numbers, like for you to step away from JP Morgan, you had to have some idea. You said you were probably going to be okay. How did you go about, and it's, you seem like you're numbers, kind of a numbers person. Did you build spreadsheets to figure this out or how did you figure it out? It, it's, I'd call it a very crude bucketing approach, which mm. was, you know, <laughs> the mortgage. We have it almost all the way paid off. But one of the things I did actually before I left, we had refinanced to a 15 year mortgage and we had uh, seven or eight years left, which was supposed to be all paid off when I turned 65. Well, I you know, left JP Morgan when I was 57, I think, or something. So mm. it wasn't paid off. That had a really high payment on it. And I refinanced <laughs> at a really good time. Luck is everything here to a 30 year, not because I was like, oh, great, we'll just take more time to pay it off. But like, I need to be able to lower the minimum payment. Like, I don't want to be on the hook for that really high minimum payment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I lowered the minimum payment. We continued to pay off as much as we can, as fast as we can. So mm -hmm. that mortgage is now very small, but but I wanted the flexibility of knowing what the cash flow was. Like, what do I have to pay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? You, you live in a high tax state. Very have you, high tax have you guys state, ever yeah. thought about moving to a lower tax environment? Oh, uh, it's a conversation I occasionally float with my husband, mm. who we live in a 1906 uh, Queen Anne Victorian house that we spent. This is part of the reason why we saved less for retirement, spent like 15 years rehabbing. Mm. Um, and we love it. And we love living where we live. So at the moment, we are not thinking about moving. I think we could downsize and stay in this town. But again, we just finished rehabbing this really nice house. And mm -hmm. it's the house where everybody comes home to for like we host 20, 15, 20 people for holidays and stuff. So at the moment, I think we're saying we're staying here for now. Um, we did, though, uh, redo some renovations in our house. And we have rented out an apartment in our house that's covering mm. our property tax. Well, that's cool. That's awesome. So that's one way. So do that cash flow. And it's like, yep, we do need to rent this apartment out. Yep, we need to rent it out. Okay, well, we'll deal with that, you know, minor inconvenience, right? I mean, we have more space than we need. And so I sort of feel good about renting it out too. But but also part of it was just cash flow. Like, yep, we got the property tax covered. If you could go back and do this financial game all over again, um, what would you do different? Um. I don't know because it ended up working out for us. Okay. But mm -hmm. that was luck as much as it was anything else. Like I, I don't have a lot of regrets, I guess. I think I would have bought fewer clothes. Mm. You know, I used to spend a lot of money on clothes. Um, I don't anymore. Uh, I would have, been a little more picky about travel and maybe spent less traveling. Like we had some wonderful experiences, you know, when you're a senior executive, you get to travel really nicely for work. And then, you know, you've got the income cash flow to support nice trips with your family. And I don't know that I regret taking any of those trips, but maybe we didn't, we could have spent less money doing it all. Mm. Um, yeah, that's good. And like I said, since it's worked out, it's easy enough for me to say, yeah, it's been okay. Um, I don't know that I I regret any of it. Could I have been more thoughtful? I wish I had been more thoughtful. And I think there was some um, spending that had we completely understood the consequences of, we might have rethought. But mm, mm, yeah, you know, some home renovations were the other thing we spent a lot of money on that we just didn't need to. Yeah. I bought a nicer car than I should have probably. And, you know, I'm going to wait till it's repair bills get big enough to, to, to reconsider that one, but mm -hmm. no, it's, it's bought. So like, all right, if I have it, I've already taken the depreciation on it. Like I'll, I'll ride that one out to the end, but yeah, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. The, the next, and probably the lot, I think that I sure appreciate you've given me a lot of yeah, time no, it's today. Been fun. Hopefully your listeners are still with us, but yes, yeah. yeah. The last question I have for you. So you've entered into this next phase of life. Um, you have a vision for where you're going. How how will Anne know if she's lived her best life when you get to the very end? What does that look like? What how 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 will we know that uh, you've accomplished it? So best is a is a strong word, and even though I use it in my book title, I think it's it's regrets. And this is something I've actually had cancer three times. And, oh wow! Um, it's one of the reasons I ended up leaving J P Morgan, which was the third time I got a cancer diagnosis. I was like, all right, <laughs> wow. 
hmm, something about my life is not working, I think. Um, so, and that does not mean, of course, that I won't have a fourth cancer diagnosis at some point, but it, the first one I had was a melanoma and it was, it was 20, 23 years ago. And it was huge. It was this huge melanoma on my arm. I could tell from the way the dermatologist was acting that she thought I was going to be dead in six months. She hadn't even biopsied it yet, but she, her hand was shaking. She's like, oh, do you have kids? I'm like, yeah, two-year-old and a four-year-old. She's like, wow. oh, and her hand was shaking. Right. And I'm like, there was none of this. Well, we only have, we send these biopsies off and don't worry. It's probably nothing. It was like, I said, well, what are the next steps? And she said, when we know how far it's spread, we'll know what to do. And I'm like, so of course I go home and the internet is a thing at this point. And I look up melanoma and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be dead in six months to, to a year. Right. I, I, I walked home convinced that I was going to be dead in six months to a year. And you, you do a fair amount of soul searching <laughs> under those circumstances. Yes. Yeah. And, and I had two regrets then, and I think I still have those two regrets, but I'm really happy to say there are things I wish I'd done differently or mm. would, would happily take a do-over, but like truly regret. Mm. There are two things, and they both happened when I was in my uh, in my 20s, actually. And the first one was I was living in Japan, and a high school classmate of mine um, was also in Japan as a sumo wrestler, and he was really famous. And, and I was like, well, I can't call him. I just would feel like I was being one of these weird stalkery people, right? And I saw him at my 10th or 15th high school reunion. And he was like, oh, and I wish I'd known you were in Tokyo. I was so lonely. And I thought, I wish I'd reached out to him. I would have had a really different experience. And that just made me feel like what a missed opportunity, right? Mm, mm. And then the second one is we lived in Italy for five and a half years in Milan. And I wish I had taken singing lessons. I really am a pretty serious musician and I it was in the home of opera and I didn't take singing lessons and <sighs> I regret that. Wow. Wow. But thank those you. are probably the only two I have. So well, like, thank you. Thank you, know, you for sharing those. Do-overs, yeah. I'd love all I I there are many things in my life I I wish I had done differently, but like truly regret if I could unwind time what I read I've said mean things to people, I managed one person horribly, I'm yeah. Regret is a big word. Like it is, yeah. It's the but it's interesting. In in your case, it's things you wish you would have done when the opportunity mm -hmm. presented itself. Yeah, that's really good. One last thought for our listeners. If there was one thing for people that are on this retirement journey, um, and you could just give them one bit of advice, what's the most important thing you want them to take away from this conversation? The the single most important thing I want people to understand with retirement and maybe even with finances, there are no right answers. There are better answers and there are less good answers. There are two wrong answers. One wrong answer is not saving. One wrong answer is not investing for the long term. Beyond that, there are a whole range of good choices, but a way I think a lot of people end up creating very difficult emotional states for themselves is thinking that there's a right answer. And if only they could figure it out, everything would be fine. You don't know what the markets are going to do. You don't necessarily have total control over how long you're going to work. You have a little control over that. You don't know what your health is going to be. You don't know when you're going to die. You can't, there is no right answer because these things are all uncertain. All you can do is the best you can do and, and hang on to flexibility. Mm. And the best you can do is saving probably 15 to 20 percent of your income for everything in your life for retirement and everything else the weddings the homes the down payments the vacations right and invest with a balanced portfolio and kind of try to let the rest go because you can't control it mm, i like that that's good and lester everybody if you uh, are interested in learning more she's got her new book your um your best financial life i saw it's on amazon thank you and i really have enjoyed this time thank you for spending yeah. some of it with me Thank you, Jason. I've enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. Take care. Thank you. You too. Information and opinions expressed here are believed to be accurate and complete for general information only and should not be construed as specific tax, legal, or financial advice for any individual and does not constitute a solicitation for any securities or insurance products. Please consult with your financial professional before taking action on anything discussed in this program. Parker Financial, its representatives, or its affiliates have no liability for investment decisions or other actions taken or made by you based on the information provided in this program. All insurance-related discussions are subject to the claims-paying ability of the company. Investing involves risk. Jason Parker is the president of Parker Financial, an independent fee-based wealth management firm located at 9057 Washington Avenue Northwest, Silverdale, Washington. 
For additional information, call 1-800-514-5046 or visit us online at soundretirementplanning.com. 